So we continue with the Caldera um, processors at Caldera Collapse with my presentation here. I want to give uh, the seismological viewpoint to this phenomena. We have seen a very nice lecture this morning uh, showing uh, analog experiments, <coughs> field evidence, how calderas look like. And we have worked a bit on the Bada Bunga Caldera Collapse and uh, studied moment tensors. Uh, and source mechanisms uh, accompanying the subsidence and the, co and the collapse itself. And I, I want to present this, but also use this as an example for the practical. The aim of the practical is to perform, so you should perform your own moment tensor inversion. So we have prepared data <coughs> from one of these events, or actually a whole day of data. And uh, I will introduce also a bit the concept of moment tensor inversion and the method we have used. So the aim is that you apply this and try to estimate your own moment tensor inversion. So the key question, as you will see in the lecture, is also how we interpret these earthquakes accompanying the collapse. And you will see this is not so trivial because there are large non-double couple components uh, in these mechanisms. And it's, a, it's, it's really not a, a clear, uh, not really solved how to interpret this for such a complex process. And an ultimate aim would be whether we can learn something from the mechanism on the magma body itself. I think we are not yet on the stage um, because our models maybe um, are not sufficiently developed for this. I think you all know this event. I have one slide here giving an overview, but, we, but there are two or three posters even on, on this uh, process where you have maybe even nicer figures, uh, and uh, most of the studies in the posters concentrate on the seismicity accompanying the lateral dike intrusion and the eruption. But uh, at the same time, uh, uh, in, for this 2014-15 Badabunga sequence, there was uh, the subsidence of 65 meter here of the caldera, which is uh, below a glacial cover. And uh, there, were, uh, there was an unusual sequence of magnitude larger four events, which are plotted here in red. Uh, and uh, so it was, was interesting from a seismological point of view to look to these. Overall, there were 35,000 events detected, mostly small events. These larger events range up to, uh, depending on which magnitude scale you use, maybe 350 or 400 events that can be started with magnitudes <coughs> larger than 3.5 and where moment tensor inversion. Can be, can be performed. So we use broadband stations from Iceland. And this shows the network. So it's the EMO broadband seismic network. The station coverage is not perfect as often, because here is a gap of stations. But overall, there are quite a lot of broadband stations. Unfortunately, there were no, cl no close by stations, which would have been very helpful. Um, so we we have to rely on these data sets, uh, or had to rely in our study um, using da stations uh, which are a bit more far away. So overall, the distance um, up to which stations could be used was 185 kilometers. And if you low pass filter the waveforms that have been recorded, for instance, here between 0 0.01 and 0 0.08 hertz, this would roughly correspond to large wavelengths, larger than 40 kilometers, up to 300 kilometers. You have seen this red cluster of events. All these, more or less, can be represented by a point source coming from the same point. But then it's interesting that you, we can, you can recognize easily that there are different clusters, event types, in the waveforms, meaning the mechanism must be different. The location is more or less the same on this range, but the mechanism is different. There's a blue and a Red cluster, maybe some more smaller ones, but these are dominant clusters. And they have been sorted here with a method very similar to what you have exercised uh, in the practical yesterday. So using these techniques, correlating waveforms, you can find out the clusters and you can make a plot like this. Uh, what we see actually is uh, rally waves or surface waves. Um, so therefore, yeah, uh, long period or in this frequency range, these, these surface waves. So. We will see later in the, or in the next slides the, the mechanism we found for these two clusters. And it turned out that they also happened to be on slightly on different sides of the caldera uh, rim faults. For the moment tensor inversion, we used um, 
a method that has just been developed is even not not published, uh, but already in use, um, which is which has the name. So Sebastian Heimann one is has developed this method. The name is Grant, and it comes from the Ring of Fire story. I think there's a there's this Grant. So maybe some of you know this. So if it's a kind of brute force method, if you want to have a solution, if you want to enter the castle, so you you use this ram and uh, put it <laughs> and, and, and drive it as long as you can to destroy the, 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 the doors of the castle. And it's a bit similar, it's a, what is done here, it's a bootstrap inversion, meaning the aim is to simply sample the whole map model space um, to find the best solution. This is not very efficient in terms of computing time, but on the other hand, the problem is not very big if you go for a point source. All together, you have 11 parameters you have to solve for. The origin time of the centroid, the centroid locations with three parameters. The moment tensor components, I will explain later what this means, uh, with six components and the duration. So these 11 parameters are solved with this bootstrap approach. And the advantage is that you can produce figures, as you see here, uh, where you can investigate more in depth the uncertainties and the trade-offs between parameters. I mean, it's not easy to make a plot with 11 dimensions and look at once, but you can make cross-sections, one parameter of, over the others. And then you see the, the families of best solutions, and you see whether there are trade-offs, for instance, here between two components, the isotropic component and the a CLVD component. You will also see later what this means. But these are, for instance, very interesting components to interpret the, the um, events in terms of, a, of collapse mechanics. And uh, unfortunately, there's a trade-off between these two parameters. And if you only have a single solution, sometimes it's not so easy to understand really what, what are the uncertainties. So this was the motivation for this method. On the, and it's also from in terms of programming in, in, with a modern language, I would say embedded in a toolbox, in a Python toolbox, and all the data processing, including restitution, all this is done during the inversion on the fly so that you can uh, easily change the parameters. And then you produce, finally, fits. And you will also produce these fits and the other plots we have seen of waveforms, of low-pass filtered waveforms in this frequency range, for instance, on the Z component, vertical component, Rayleigh waves. And the, on, on, and the transversal waves. So this is actually what was inverted uh, for these relatively re, uh, large distances in regional ranges. So you see uh, uh, overlaying the observed and the synthetic seismograms in these plots. Um, you see also some other parameters that are given, and we can uh, uh, explain this in more detail during the, the lecture. Overall, the fit is, is very good. As you see, so you would think your solution, your best solution, is a, must be a good solution. But as I said, also for the laugh waves on the transversal component, but as I said, uh, there, that this does not mean that all parameters are very resolved. So this is the aim of the exercise. And the, the example here introduces you to this method, in principle, and what we have done for the Badabunga collapse. So we, we applied this method first simply yeah, running a centroid moment tensor inversion. And then the figure looked like this. Here you see the caldera rim. You see the centroid locations and the uncertainties. And you already see two types of mechanisms plotted here in this lower hemispherical projection. Um, later, uh, we will discuss this a bit more. But what you can also see is, I mean, there are some trends. You can possibly observe that red events, this red type events, have a different mechanism as the blue ones. And they are more shallow. This is a depth section than the blue ones. In, in the other few also, then the red ones are more in the south than the blue ones. But overall, it is not really satisfying because the uncertainties in, in epicentral location, for instance, and in depths seem to be quite large. So we thought a bit what can be done to improve this. And it's not uh, so trivial because if you work with these long wavelengths, actually, you don't have high resolution. So the, but it's maybe an example what you can try. If you only have such data, these broadband data, and you want to improve your resolution a bit. Uh, but finally, the processing scheme is then non-standard, I would say, and, and a bit more complicated. Therefore, we prepared this plot. So you, 
this is not for the practical, but it shows you how we try to improve the location, for instance, together with the moment tensor inversion. So we had, in principle, two branches of analysis. The moment tensor inversion is this branch, too. But at the same time, you can do what you have learned yesterday. You can make these cross correlations. You can, for this purpose, you can even go to higher frequencies. And you can uh, find this template matching. There are 400 events could be studied there. And then you can analyze pairs of events, estimate relative times between the wave arrivals, and uh, associate them with clusters of families of earthquakes. You can estimate a relative strength. If you know all the events in one cluster have the similar waveforms, you can estimate a relative strength if they all come from more or less the same point source. So a, a relative moment can be estimated precisely and a relative location. But this is, but if you go to the moment tensor inversion, you have to, and you want to invert for 11 parameters, you have to ensure that this is a point source, um, meaning you need long wavelength. And then um, you, 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 you can run your inversion at these lo longer wavelengths, but you can introduce station corrections. And this is what we tried. So we tried from the ensemble of all the data coming from the same cluster to estimate systematic the residuals at single stations and introduce station corrections. It's a standard to introduce station corrections for location. So for the centroid location, it's, it would be standard to, esti to, to introduce phase shifts for station corrections. But uh, we also try to, to consider amplitude corrections, which is not, not really standard. But it seems that it worked and really improved the results. So then we had good, let's say, the best moment tensor solution we had, we could get. But for locating the events, we could use then the results from these studies, high frequency studies, and and then we can we finally produce these plots in comparison to before. If we add the stations corrections, station corrections in our moment tensor inversion, the figure already looks a bit better in the term, in the sense that the events are more clustered and more confined to the caldera. The, the depth here uh, in between 10 kilometers and 2 kilometers, and the assumed reservoir depth is in around 10 kilometer. And then if you add the um, the relative locations from the cross correlation of waveforms and associate these with the type of events, then the figure finally that comes out looks like this. So this is, let's say, the, the best result as we interpret it. Um, and here you see now interesting patterns much more clearly. You see that the both types of events are more or less um, occurring on the northern and southern flank of of this rim fault. There seem no events or no large events to occur here. This is not true for the very, very small events, but for the larger events, they only occur here, which already in, possibly indicates the highest strains, strain rates should have occurred on these two sides. And the depth of these clusters is, is different as we have already seen before, maybe even better seen here, and the mechanism. So this is an, an, has a normal faulting component. We will discuss this a bit, a bit more. This also, but the strike of, of the nodal planes here would be north-south, while here it's, if, you've, if you try to interpret it, it's more in this direction or more subparallel to the caldera um, rim fault. Um, what you and usually you would expect from what, what we have seen this morning, if this is related, associated with faulting on the sides, that the strike should be subparallel to the ring fault and not perpendicular. Is so, there any time variation in the, in the mechanism? Well, they vary a bit, but, but there's, no systematic, there's no systematic time variation. So there, 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 I will show a figure where you see this in terms of the moment release. There's, a, there's a, some systematics, and it can be easily, nicely explained. So maybe this is a, so we want to interpret this mechanism you have seen. You've seen these projections. I think most of you, in principle, know what this means. But I, in, I inserted in the in the in this uh, presentation some very basic slides. We can go quickly over this, but only for those that possibly are not not absolutely familiar with the seismological concepts. The the, the radiation pattern. Finally, this is what we want to estimate. If you have a double couple, we know that the radiation pattern for P waves look like this. You have these four lobes, and for S wave, it's different. But this is the radiation pattern of a double couple, 
of a shear crack, poorly shear crack, and it, it radiates this P and S waves in different uh, columns, and usually you estimate the nodal planes. This is what I just tried to interpret, although it was not a, a double couple component that was plotted. Uh, so this is uh, associated with the P wave radiation pattern, and uh, yeah, one point of discussion is always what is the true fault plane because this point source solution cannot distinguish between the true fault plane and the auxiliary plane. Uh, they are both equivalent. If you plot this in a, in a, yeah, in a projection here, it, it looks much more simpler, and these are the plots you often see. Um, for P wave radiation, these four lobes, for S waves, it's just turned. Maybe it's interesting to see that in the far field and near field, it looks different. Not the orientation of the black and red lobes, but the relative size. It already shows you that if you can consider broadband stations from far field and near field, and the transient signal you measure, you would really have additional uh, resolution on the double couple component. But often your stations are too far away, as also in our case, uh, in terms of the broadband centers. And then it's also well known that this can this radiation pattern is plotted in a lower hemisphere and can be associated to the faults. I, I don't, and the orientation and dip of the faults. So, but coming back now to the moment tensor, the moment tensor is, is a general representation of a point source, not only a double couple or a shear crack, and it, it's a three times three matrix, and it represents force couples, generalized force couples, with arm and without arm in the diagonal, diagonal element of diagonal with arm. So it's a general representation of a point source that can be associated to dislocation sources like shear cracks, but also to other types of sources. It's symmetric, this tensor, and uh, as I said, a general representation. Overall, since it's symmetric, these are six components, and these are the six components we want to invert for. In principle, it is also time dependent. Every component is time dependent, but if you really go to this point source approximation, it's sufficient to have these six components. You, will, you do not need really to resolve details of the time process. Um, the, the moment tensor that you get, this is the, 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 the result you want to interpret. And usually you, 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 you have to do a moment tensor decomposition. Uh, you decompose, we can decompose the moment tensor in a yeah, unique way in an isotropic part and the rest, this is the deviatoric part. The isotropic part is associated with volume change during the earthquake process, but the deviatoric part is, there's no unique decomposition uh, valid, so there are several opportunities or possibilities how to decompose it. Most um, common is to decompose the deviatoric part in a best double couple and a CLVD. A CLVD is a vector dipole that is compensated for the volumetric change compensated linear vector dipole. But you can also decompose it in a mixed mode dislocation. If you think the deviatoric part or, or the general source has to be represents a, like a shear crack under mixed mode dislocation, shear and opening at the same time, then you can also use such a decomposition, but it's different. And the result would also look different and the angles of the, of the planes would look different. So this is the, the problem with the interpretation of moment tensors and the decomposition. And as, as I said, it's a non-unique problem, so it depends always on the, on the process you study. You cannot say this is always valid in this or the other way. Um, if you want to learn more on moment tensors, I mean, there, I want to point out that there is this new manual of seismic observatory practice. It's an online lecture material uh, with very many different chapters including also a chapter on moment tensor description and moment tensor decomposition. So it can be quite useful, and if you want to plot moment tensor solutions, or you want to decompose them according to the standard decomposition, you can, I can recommend this program. It's a Python program you can download, and you can visualize the radiation pattern of a general moment tensor, of, a shear, of, the, shear, of the double couple component. You can uh, plot this from different viewpoints. You can, this is platform independent, and you can also decompose the moment tensor. 
Um, for instance, here you see, I mean, I, only quickly, so you simply type in MOPAD, describe, and then your components of the moment tensor you have, you, the coordinate system for which this has been derived, and then you get some results on strike, dip, break, and so on. Um, or you can decompose it so you get numerical uh, results for the decomposed parts of the double couple, the isotropic part, and the percentage of these. So without going in the theory, I at least show you on this decomposition, I, you have this tool available, and you can also look to the paper associated, associated, associated with this. And you can also see how, you, how this looks if you then plot these mechanisms, the radiation patterns of, general, of moment tensors in different projections, most often either Lambert or stereographic projections are used. Okay, but how, what, what does the, maybe it's, it's worth to look before we come then to the interpretation of the Badabunga events a bit more to the different elementary sources. The shear crack is well known, I think. In terms of a moment tensor, it has only yeah, two components, non-zero, and which are, have to be the same because it's um, in, in, if it's plotted like this, if, because it's a symmetric tensor. Um, this is, for instance, a shear crack where the slip is in one direction and the fault normal is in three direction. And the strength of the source is, is given by the, this is the shear modulus in my notation, by the average dislocation and the area on the fault. So if you estimate, and this is related to the seismic moment directly, that you can estimate, if you know the seismic moment, you can try, and you know, for instance, the area and the, uh, and, uh, and the shear modulus, you can estimate the average slip of a source. Here, yeah, it, it is uh, plotted these two components that are non-zero for and the radiation pattern associated with the double couple. Maybe more of interest is then how, how does the radiation pattern look if you have a tensile crack? So opening, poor opening, if it's horizontally, you would have uh, three components here in the diagonal element. Uh, two are the first Lame parameters, and then, this, and then two times the shear modulus in the last component added. So if you would add here the trace, you would find that there's also an isotropic component left. A trace is non-zero here, and uh, this means there's an, a volumetric change associated with this shear crack. Um, and the strength is also related to the opening in this case and the... And the um, this opening and, and the area. So this can also be, this can really be observed. And we have a nice example from a mine collapse where we studied this, magnitude 3.7 in Poland here. And it was a broadband moment tensor inversion, for instance, using the program you will also use. So altogether 18 traces, also inverting this in low, at low frequencies. And the result looks like this, pretty much as what we have seen before for, for a poor tensile crack. And the interesting thing here, so there's a significant implosion component of 60%, but it was a mine collapse, and therefore um, all this makes sense. At one moment. And you see that, uh, or it was documented in this case, that there was a rock burst occurring um, in the mine. And uh, this is well known because even workers have been trapped in the mine for some days. They could even see, in principle, what, what has happened, and it was investigated quite good. Uh, interestingly, this, this all, all this mine collapse event was triggered by a small shear crack that um, triggered, in principle, the collapse event. Um, yeah, there was a question. Sorry? This? Yes. Then this is not tensile, but the, the not opening, but closing. Depending on whether it's opening or closing, the colors will change here. So, no, sorry. This is opening, and this is closing. This is motion. The first motion is positive or negative. If it's positive, it's colored. And if it would be horizontally and it goes up, 
then it would be, I would expect, directly above to have a positive ground motion. But the color yeah, tells you whether this is uh, either explosive or implosive. You can also look to the explosion moment tensor, which is very simple. And for instance, this is an explosion in terms of volume expansion. There's no radiation pattern at all. The P waves are radiated with the, with the same amplitude in all directions. And, and in theory, no S waves are uh, radiated. The moment tensor is uh, only all components are, are the same on the diagonal element. It's independent of the orientation of the tensor, always this, and the strength is given by this factor here. Um, and this can also be tried to, 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 we can try to see some cases where explosions have occurred recently in North Korea. You had two interesting explosions, nuclear explosions, in January and in uh, June this year. We also studied these events uh, with broadband stations, also arrays, and then you can see uh, this, the moment tensor solution. It's not a poor explosive component, isotropic component, but the major portion is isotropic for both events. So in this case, nearly 60% or 50% has this explosive component. But there, as you see, are also some other components involved. Uh, the overall radiation pattern of the moment tensor looks like here. This is the, simply the result we found. And this is a decomposition in a standard way with the largest part, the isotropic component, but also a CLVD part and a double couple part even, 33%. And it's always debated, what does this mean? How, could this, how can this be interpreted? Uh, but it's, uh, yeah, and one option is that during the explosion, there are also like for a caldera process, but maybe then the other way, there are ring faults or some faults activated, for instance, above or below this area that, that uh, is uh, under, affected from the explosion. If you, if you plot these components, the different components uh, with Mopad, for instance, here you see, again, there's a Houtney mine example and a poor shear crack strike slip uh, from, from the Gulf of California. Um, you can also produce plots like this, which is a different representation. This is this Hudson-type plot where you can better investigate how large is the isotropic component, how large is the shear crack component. In this plot, if it's a poor shear crack, like this earthquake here, the, the point or this should um, is represented by a point on these two axes, which is zero, zero. So this means a poor shear crack. If it's a poor opening or closing crack, it would be oriented or it, it would be positioned here, which is, um, yeah, clearly the case for the Hutner mine. And if it's isotropic, it should be here. If it's explosive or if it's an implosion, it should be here. So these plots are quite helpful if you want to understand the, comp the portions of the different components uh, in one figure. For instance, for the Korea explosion, it, it does not look so simple. The two investigated are these thick points. And if it would be only isotropic, it would, po it would be here. But you see there are some other components also involved. Interesting was that there had been some more nuclear explosion in Korea in the years before, studied by others, and they had solutions here and here. And we were puzzled a lot on whether this is so different uh, or not. But uh, using this grant, what you will apply, where you investigate the uncertainties. And if we only plot the uncertainties we have with our solutions, then we see that there's a a large smearing in this type of plot of the different components, and this covers more or less exactly the range that, of solutions that had been found before. So meaning maybe the, it was not so different. It's always the same. It's more a problem of inversion and uncertainties. It, it points a bit to this problem. It's important to know how, how good the parameters are resolved, what they are the uncertainties, and what are the trade-offs. So now coming back to Badabunga. Um, we had this result, as you see, with this mechanism. I have to see whether, and now only the double couple component is plotted in the radiation pattern. You see better the strike, which is here north-south and here, yeah, nearly, no, well, a bit inclined, but more subparallel to the fault. So we have t these two types. We have for both components, as you will see later, large CLVD components, often 50% or yeah. And we have these two clusters, A 
is shallow, which is the red one, and B is deep in the north, which is the blue one. Um, the centroids are not in the center, so they are clearly separated one by each other, which also already tells you something on the, on the process in principle. I will discuss it later. And the moment release rate is different for A and B. And this was your question. And here's now the, the figure. If we plot the moment release of blue and red, you see clearly it's, it's different. This is the cumulative moment. This is the time over the whole uh, period of, of the eruption principle when these events occurred, so nearly 200 days or a bit less, uh, you see that the blue ones start with high moment release rate, the deep ones, but then um, saturated while the red ones continued much longer. And this tells us something, maybe, whether the faults grow from bottom to top or not. Because you mentioned yesterday, uh, they always grow from top to bottom. <laughs> this would, in principle, uh, show the opposite. Yeah. <laughs> okay. It's it's. Uh, but it's interesting here, and we will we will see a simulation later on, on this. So how can how can these events be interpreted if there is a large CLVD component? There had been many studies before on seismological studies on um, caldera uh, events, collapse or or even uplift events also, and uh, suggesting, for instance, that the seismic events are associated with slip on the ring faults. And then it depends on whether you have outward dipping or inward dipping ring faults or poorly vertical. So exactly what we have seen this morning, uh, it makes a difference in the mechanism you would expect. In this case, you would expect, as it was mentioned, a thrust faulting, apparent thrust faulting type. And the, if it's subsiding during a collapse event, uh, you would then have the black part in the middle Correct, yes. And in this, because you have yeah, this thrust faulting, and this would lead to, a, to just the opposite. So we can look to our CLVD component, for instance, and, and try to see whether it fits to one or the other. But there is uh, another problem that this model, if, this really, if really the whole ring fault would be, would be active, and only then the solutions are valid in principle, then the centroid should be exactly in the middle. And you cannot explain that the, that the centroid is, is once here and once here. And this is something we do not observe. Another point is if the faults are vertical or sub-vertical, there's a, actually no radiation. Maybe it's wrong to say there's no radiation, but at least no um, radiation of second order moment tensors, meaning the low frequency content is highly attenuated, but high frequency waves would be radiated. This is something that, uh, in principle, we also do not observe. And we don't think that during this collapse, the whole ring fault was active. Only parts of it, which can be better described by the parts of the, of the fault slip. So then we, we try to use a standard decomposition, for instance, for this mechanism B on the northern rim, the deeper ones. But we had this strange observation that the double couple component had a north-south orientation with a standard decomposition in a CLVD and a, and a double couple component. This is the full moment tensor, how it is plotted. But you can make a, you can make an, a simple experiment. You can assume that you have an outward dipping fault in the north. This is more or less evident from, from other observations. And, and say the mechanism I, I observe is maybe a composite mechanism of two processes. One process is the slip on the fault, and the other could be a reaction of the magma reservoir below. The magma reservoir would very likely have only a, a CLVD component vertically oriented, so a vertical CLVD, while the um, thrust faulting event would have the strike. So if you simply add these two components in your point source solution, you would, for long wavelength radiation, see only both together. And if you give different weights to them, to the double couple and the CLVD from these two different sources, you can generate a, a, a bundle of mechanisms you would finally find with your moment tensor inversion. And you see, if you decompose them in a standard way, you flip suddenly from a east-west oriented 
double coupled component to a north south and also the sign from thrust to normal faulting flips this would this is a simply a fact that the overall mechanism is here controlled by the CLVD and this over prints or in principle the double couple radiation so and if it's controlled by the double couple then you would not find this result so in principle this tells us a standard decomposition in some cases can be can be difficult um, especially if the double couple component is small if it's very large you would not risk to make a mistake but if it's smaller even smaller maybe than the CLVD component, you have to be very careful by interpreting the double couple component. For the southern rim, we can make the same game, assuming that this is a really vertical fault, and then, um, so this would be in, the, in this range, for instance, we, would, uh, we can explain exactly what we observe with the standard decomposition. So maybe the mechanism flip from the orientations um, is, is simply related to the standard decomposition and to the fact that this is maybe not appropriate in our case. So I've not shown yet a figure of what, what is thought about the shape of the caldera. Um, this is from a paper recently published where we have also contributed uh, on one side with this modeling here, this DEM modeling, and with the moment tensors you have just seen. Um, so here you see again the, the, the caldera rim. You see here, the micro earthquakes, which could be located with a, with a, a local short period sensor network, and you see in this cross section that there, it's already indicated that that one fault is on this cross section here is sub vertical, the southern one, and the other is light, slightly outward dipping. And this was also used in this model, and then and this model could very well explain the subsidence, this asymmetric subsidence. Uh, but this is uh, not an an, an elastic continuum model. It's a dis distinct element model that considers also inelastic um, processes. Um, and nice is to see that you pl here it is plotted uh, in, in this result the um, strain rate. So high strain rate during the collapse is in, in yellow or red. So you see there's clearly high strain rate along the ring faults, which can be expected if all this is subsiding. But there are also some parts in, in, the, in, the, in the body that experience apparently high um, strain rates. And the idea was, if we plot this again um, here, um, maybe a bit clearer from the coloring. And if we only look to these two samples, if we say one of the events, clusters, we observe is in the south, this would be here. No, here, this is north, sorry, north is deep. This is in the south, uh, shallow. And if for some reasons the ring fault, or if we assume that may, most of this ring fault is simply aseismic subsiding, but here in this area where there's a, a lot of uh, um, yeah, friction and, str and high strain rates, we have the cluster of deep events. And in this part where there's a complexity, we have the um, the, the shallow events, type A and B. And we can also compare this with the rates we expect for the earthquakes. So this was the observed rate for red and blue, moment release rate. If we count simply the moment release rate from the simulation uh, for red and blue, assuming these two clusters, we at least can, can more or less uh, find or explain this pattern that the deep ones start so in principle, the process of high strain rate starts from the bottom and grows to the top in this, in this numerical model. And this is confirmed also with, with the rate of seismicity, which can in principle also already be seen if you simply plot the depth of the, of the events versus time by I. You would also say that there's a, it looks like an upward migration for the largest event, which would tell in principle this. OK, so this is uh, in principle the interpretation of the events. Um, what we think it's likely, or it is possible at least, that this is a, 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 a source process consisting of two different sources. Uh, one is related to the radiation of, of waves, is related to shear faulting, but also to maybe a response of the magma reservoir. This would be very interesting, but as I said, it's not uh, fully established, this model. And the problem is maybe also, if you look here, 
in this Hudson blot again to all solutions we found for red and blue, you see these trade-offs, and they are relatively large. And uh, the only thing you can definitely say is they all have a negative CLVD, but some of them have positive isotropics and, and other negative isotropic components. Um, I personally speculate that this isotropic component may be related to the depth and to the gas content, but this is uh, not all of, of our co-authors uh, agree to this. Therefore, we have not found a common conclusion now on this, how to interpret this, because simply the trade-off is large, so it's, it's really a question whether you should interpret the isotropic component at all or not. So in this sketch, in principle, you see a possible mechanism. Um, you have uh, this caldera, you have the subsidence, the piston goes down during the depletion of the reservoir. This, and on this side, this is mostly um, aseismic, and we find two clusters of events. One would be here in the inner part, and the other here where we have maybe due to the geometry of the ring faults, the complexity in, in, the, in the faults that start to grow. And um, if always, if there is an event with a shear crack, uh, at the same time, you would also possibly see a reaction, co-seismic reaction of this magma chamber leading to an, a vertical CLVD component. And this is in principle what is, what is written here. And I think I directly come to the, to the last slides now um, to make the, yeah, to, to start in principle explaining a bit the exercise. So what you can do is now to, to check our results in principle <laughs> with the moment tensor inversion. inversion. And, and then we hope that you first learn how, how a moment tensor inversion can be run and what the possible problems are. You should also learn then in, investigate these trade-offs and what happens if you change some parameters, if you include stations or exclude stations, if you change the frequency range. But it's clear that in one and a half hour you cannot do all. But you can start with a prepared data set and then you can play with uh, at home and, and continue if you are interested or you can contact us. I've not really said a lot on moment tensor inversion itself. The idea is in principle simple. You have your source in the sketch plotted here. There's maybe a complex source process, as we just discussed, maybe even two sources. But if you uh, low-pass filter your events, you really go to a point source solution. This can be described more or less as a step function. And you have your observation at the station. And uh, this is also, in the near field, for instance, this would also be only a step if you go to the very long periods. And in the far field, this would then be a, a pulse of the wave going, so a very simple waveform. So if you know the radiation, or if you know the wave propagation from the source to the station, then you, you, and you have a representation equation, represent, representation theorem of moment tensors that states that the displacement you observe at the station is simply a function or a linear function of the moment tensor, which describes the six independent component in the point source, times the green functions. It's uh, derivatives of green functions, but all this, what is here, is sim simply the green function term or a green's tensor. Then you can, if you have more than one observations, so this is here a, a component of the observations, so north, east, or z component. If you have many stations, many components, you can write one equation after the other. You have a matrix equation, and at some point it will become overdetermined. You have more observations and unknowns, and you can simply solve for this. So this is, in a, in a nutshell, very quickly, in principle, what you do. So you need data from the stations, and you need green functions. And this is the most important point with this slide um, to make clear. Only with data you cannot uh, invert. You need the green functions and you have to calculate them. And green functions, in this case, are simply synthetic seismograms for elementary sources. Um, and this package you will use is a, is a whole toolkit package that partly can calculate green functions. You can plot green functions. You can look to data, filter data. You can restitute the data. You can uh, download the data from the internet directly and, and start the inversion. 
um, all done in, in more or less one toolkit, which is called Pyroco. And this is the page here, and we have installed this on the machines because it would possibly be too slow if everyone wants to install it. And uh, yeah, as you see, there are standalone applications which have nothing really to do with quant, but uh, we will partly maybe try to use Snuffler to look at two waveforms. So it's a waveform viewer. And yeah, actually maybe if I still have time, I can try because I opened it here. So you will see, this is Snuffler. If you, if you open it, you see the data set you have. It's one day, 24 hours, if I look, this broadband data. And there are some uh, seen in the screen, but you can scroll up and down, or with minus and plus, you can reduce maybe the size. And then you can, uh, but you don't see the seismograms here. This is because it, it, we want to have it efficient if you look to the whole data set, but you can easily skew, scroll with the mouse. And you see here, for instance, there are three events in this whole data set, magnitude 4.5 or this one. We can, we can check one of the other. We can zoom in, and at some point, then if you have close enough, you see the waveforms. So these are the waveforms. You also see that some are marked already because they were clipped. And you should, during an inversion, avoid to invert clipped traces. You, you have to throw them out. But it's easier to look to the waveforms to, to pick them simply, and then the program has, there's a pick file. You, this is considered for uh, clip traces, and then they, they will not use these traces simply. You can also filter a bit. Maybe I make this larger. And you can hear in this snuffler, it's nice that you can, you can simply filter a bit these waveforms. So you see how they change. Low pass filter, high pass filter. And then you can try to investigate whether the signal noise ratio is sufficient if you go to low, lower frequency ranges. So you, you should investigate a bit how deep is it, is it useful, the filter we have used. Or can you even go to lower frequencies? Maybe for the largest events you can. But if you possibly, I mean, if you look here in this data set, you see there are many more events which are, have not been picked. So you can also try to, to invert for a small event that is seen here. They are all, most of them are really from this caldera. So you have many options, but I, I don't want to explain now all what is Snuffler doing. Um, there's one, <laughs> one small problem on my laptop, actually. My Mac, it's not working since I have not properly working. Therefore, I cannot show all these things uh, since I have uh, updated the the um, Mac OS X system. Um, but for instance, you can map, you can plot a map with these snufflings. And you can do this on these machines there, where you can see the stations um, and the sensors. Or you can then also try to plot simply the phases, phase arrivals of P and S waves to help to interpret whether this is a P wave or an S wave, um, which is also a snuffling, which is called cake phases. And the other one is map. Um, OK, but now going back here, and actually I have to check how much time I still have, if at all. I think we have still some minutes, not? Yes, you do. OK. So where have I been? So this grant package relies on this Pyroco. Python tools with all these things like Snuffler, Cake, we have seen. For Mosto, it's maybe of interest. We will not try it here, but because we have prepared the green function data set already. But uh, you, can, you can also calculate, your, calculate it yourself, green functions. And therefore, you can use this for Mosto package. Um, you can choose between different programs. In this case, it was a program for a layered Earth model a reflectivity code, but you can also work with spherical codes. And actually, the spherical code is very interesting for those working with uh, also with static displacement, because in, it includes also gravity and static displacement and the atmosphere and ocean coupling. All this is included, and you can calculate your green functions with this. It's this uh, 
page, you can look to some more information for the green function database uh, that we have also provided. So if you don't want to calculate your own green function, but for instance, if you work globally, there's a web page where you can already download Earth models and green functions. Or if you calculate a new one, you can send it to us and we can upload it here. <laughs> so there's a database of green functions because this green function calculation can be time consuming, depending on whether how, what is the frequency range, how large is the, the model, and so on. So this is in a directory provided. Um, and this is, in principle, what, you, what I suggest to do. And actually, what I have a small presentation, but I, we also printed out this, what you see here, and some more information how to use this program. Um, and these two pages belong together. Um, one is an introduction in quant, and what is the config file, what the parameters means. And the other one is, what is it? Yeah, how to get started in principle on this system here, because you have to do some copies before and some small installations. Everyone has to do. I will show this on the screen during the practical, but maybe it's good if you also have this sheet, because everyone has a different speed. And then you can simply also go after these commands and try to, to do this all. So we prepared this data set you've just seen. There's a. A bundle of earthquakes inside, but uh, at least three, actually it's wrong, three larger than five, and many more larger than four, I think. They, here's another mistake. They are not restituted, this data. As I said, it will be done during the inversion. It was simply my uh, old, <laughs> old approach that I, I typed in here. Um, so the directory with green functions is provided, and the software has been installed already. And the idea is that you, I mean, there's already a configure file. And in principle, there are examples for the commando, commands you can use to run this program. And you can, in principle, only run the program. Um, but the idea is you first look to the data. You check the quality of the data. You can define a blacklist of stations. This is maybe a main work if you think this station is bad. I don't want to invert it. You can put it in the configure file, and then it will not be considered. And um, yes, this is in principle what should be done. And you should also then interpret the trade-offs and, and try to evaluate your, res your result, whether you think this is a good result or not. Um, let me see. I think this is the, the end, yes. You didn't say anything about source time. Yeah. Yeah, actually, because for the practical, we, we do not invert for the source time function. We go to, to so low f long wavelengths, long, low frequencies, that we assume simply, in principle, a step function or sim a simple pulse. But do you have information on the source time functions of any of the slip events in Bonner Bonner? Mm, not, not, no detailed information. Actually, it would be possible to do this. And, this, and there are also, you have even seen it here on the poster, there are near field observations. I mean, high, uh, high rate GPS data, for yeah, instance. Yeah. They are also limited in, in, with the sampling, but um, there are also these short period stations. And if this would be included, if this data set would come together, I think you can learn something on the source time function. But this has not yet been possible for some reasons. Yes, 